good morning welcome back to the channel today's video we're going to talk about the top movers and fallers i've bought virgin galactic i've received one dividend payment and i've maximized my iso allowance so i'm going to talk a bit about what i'm doing there so if you want to know all of that plus more like the video subscribe to the channel ring that notification bell and if you're new to investing i'm using free trade at freetrade.io forward slash infant hyphen investors click on the link sign up deposit one pound you get a free share of up to 200 pounds let's get straight into the top movers for the week now the first top mover to talk about was a top faller of last week and that is uber so uber has gone up 6.35 percent i will be quoting percentages from simply wall street and that's basically because uber has sold a stake in their freight business so of all of the different business units and business lines that uber has they've got uber freight and that's basically a logistics business that's all around truckers shipping cargo from warehouses onto shipping lanes um, and obviously internationally as well as locally as well so you know that uber freights business is is doing okay however they've basically sold a stake to greenbrier equity a new york based private equity firm which led a group of investors to commit about 500 million dollars to uber freight this values the business at a 3.3 billion valuation post money uber still retains a majority stake in the business now the goal and the reason why they did this is to reduce their exposure to non-core ventures so if you look at all of uber's ventures you would see that ride hailing is their main venture uber eats is their secondary main venture and then they've obviously got some other side ventures as well you know from self-driving vehicles to the electric bikes that they're doing and uber freights and a few other stuff as well now obviously due to divoc 91 their cash flow was significantly reduced with the whole uber ride hailing business which is their bread and butter effectively uh, and because of that they're trying to basically protect cash flow so investors are seeing this as a positive move to protect cash flow um, reduce the amount of risk that they're obviously taking on and obviously introduce more investors that apparently are actually leaders in this logistics space as well who can potentially help uber weather this storm and do well in the future so there's been a positive reaction and that's the reason why it's gone up 6.35 percent the next stock to talk about was again a Another top faller for last week and that is legal and general now there's not been that much news that i personally believe and this is all opinion at the end of the day that i personally believe has contributed to the share price increase in this week apart from the fact that there's been some insider trading activity so primarily speaking the chairman bought about seventy four thousand pounds worth of shares valued at one pound 77 per share and then a person called rick lewis is a non-executive director bought 1300 shares as well now when you're actually talking about this in terms of numbers and contextually speaking this isn't that much they're not you know huge sums of numbers we talked about cloudflare by selling what 5.3 million dollars worth of shares last week those are the types of numbers you'd want to be hearing in terms of what's really going to move the needle in terms of the share price but i think there's been a small vote of confidence i think if you combine that with the fact that lng went down quite significantly last week which you can kind of see on your screen i think um there was probably bound to be a little bit of a bounce back because again it is a well-run business um so that combined with the fact that the in, there's some insider dealing i think is why lng has done okay this week as well and now the top mover for this week probably deserves a drum roll but you know i can't do drum rolls let alone play the drums even so i'm just gonna call it out and that is lloyd's lloyd's has gone up this week not 2.26 percent because that would be incorrect it's gone up 9.39 percent this week um and i think there's basically been chatter around lloyd's reinstating dividends so we're going to talk a little bit about it and my thoughts and feelings on that so first of all there's been an article from ceam which basically headlines and says nat western lloyd's signal willingness to bring back dividends the Lloyd's chief executive Antonio Horto Osario said the lenders board would not make a decision on dividends until the end of the year. So we've only got a couple of months left for that to happen. And then it said Horto Osario added that Lloyd's had a very, very strong buffer. I've always called out on multiple videos that Lloyd's balance sheet is, I wouldn't say perfect, but it's pretty flawless. They've got a lot of revenue. They've got, you know, they've been making profitable quarter they've been profitable quarter by quarter but the issue is they've had a lot of issues 
from a regulatory standpoint. Last year, it was all about PPI. This year, it's all about the Divock 91 situation. So these significant factors have caused, you know, lawyers to basically not be able to report profits, even though they've actually been profitable business because they've had to reserve money to basically either pay out you and me um, due to the PPI situation, or obviously, you know, stop paying dividends so they can actually retain um, cash flow on their balance sheet as well. Now, they basically said that the bank's capital buffers far exceed the requirements set by the Bank of England. Remember when this whole Divock 91 situation started to manifest, the Prudential Regulation Authority and the Bank of England basically advised all financial businesses to not pay dividends. Now, this was a strong guidance. They can't obviously mandate for these businesses to not do so, but they basically advised them to do so because everyone was panicking and scared. And obviously, most businesses decided to dividend cut and stop paying dividends. Now, you had businesses like legal and general who was another top mover we just took we just spoke about who actually went against this guidance and continued to pay their dividends so they continued to pay dividends throughout the course of the year whereas most other companies actually didn't and that had a significant impact to the uk economy as a whole and obviously you know a lot of these uk businesses and i always said that i think the moment that lloyds reinstates their dividends you're going to see a very very significant um, spike in the share price now i think even when they announce that they'll be paying their dividends you'll see the significant spike let alone when they actually start doing that the reason why i believe that is, that is if you actually look at the the investors for lawyers as in obviously me and you are retail investors but if you look at all of the other people that invest in lawyers you've got so many pensions that rely on lawyers so many hedge funds so many corporate institutions there's so much institutional investors and smart money as they call it that actually basically invest into lawyers as a business and rely on those dividends that actually the inflows of money is going to be extremely significant it's not just going to be the regular you know Derek from Dartmouth for you know Patrice from Portsmouth or whatever that's going to be investing into lawyers when they reinstate their dividends you're going to be talking about other banks you're going to be talking about pensions you're going to be talking about hedge funds you're going to be talking about significant inflows of money that's going to be going into the business that's the reason that's primarily the reason why I've held strong on lawyers throughout a significant downturn over the course of the year and why I feel that it can have the potential to go back to the levels it was before, you know, around the 60p mark. Will it do that? I don't know. Um, I have zero confidence in the UK economy in actually it doing that. But I think if you just weigh up the pros and cons and the risks, I think, you know, there is, there is, I guess an educated guess of mine is that it can actually at least even get halfway there, to be honest. Now, it going up 10% this week just on the potential that they might be actually going back to um, reinstating dividends, I think is a bit of a sign um, of that. I think when they actually announce that, yes, we are from this date going to be paying dividends, it's going to be this amount, it's going to be on a quarterly basis and blah, blah, blah. I think that announcement is going to see the share price rise probably be about 10, 20%. And then I think when they actually start paying dividends, I think people um, will again start investing back into this business. So I think um, at this current moment, um, if you don't already invest in lawyers, it might be a good time to get in. I mean, I don't want to advise you what to do. It's just completely your choice. I'm personally going to continue just to hold lawyers. You know, I definitely did some averaging down quite considerably over the past, you know, um, during the summer months, so to speak. But I'm happy with how much I've got in there at the moment. And I'm just going to sit tight and wait and see what basically happens with Lloyds at the moment. So, yeah, Lloyds being a top mover is very interesting. I don't think that's happened for a very 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 long time and we shall see whether this continues not only into next week but you know the trend continues to the end of the year i think with brexit even the u.s elections i think it's going to have you know still some significant headwinds that it's going to have to be dealing with so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there anyway let's get straight into the top fallers there's only two top fallers to talk about this week because generally it's been a good week in the market this week so the first top faller is micro hard which has gone down 0.78 percent i mean to be honest i shouldn't have really even included it 0.78 percent is not really um it's insignificant it's less than one percent and for a business of this size um basically means nothing at all so we can basically just move past that one the main top faller to talk about this week as you can see is sentiment so sentiment has basically gone down 2.3 to 21.37 percent um, basically shares in sentiment has basically fallen 
after the company reduced its production guidance. We talked a bit about it on Instagram. So follow the Instagram at Infant Investors if you want to get information before the weekend. And this is basically following a suspension of operations at its Sakari mine in Egypt. So it's, it's Sakari mine. It's basically its main mine. Um, and they suspended operations. Um, while the precise impact isn't really known, it's basically estimated that the fourth quarter production will reduce by about 70,000 ounces. Um, and this is basically sentiment um, estimating them this themselves. So this is not coming from, you know, external analysts thinking this. This is actually coming from sentiment, which is why it's had such a significant impact to the share price movement. Um, and the reason why they've done this was a precautionary measure as they detected movement in a localized area of waste material. So that potentially affecting some of its business. Now, I think it's a bit of a drastic fall, if I'm honest. Um, I didn't expect it to fall this, I mean, had I not, had this not happened, then it probably would be like 1% increase this week. Obviously, over the course of the year, sentiment was doing really well, um, probably sitting around, yeah, you can see like 85% um, throughout the course of the year, you know, at some points even, I think, hitting around the 90% mark. And then obviously it dropping, basically reducing it to about a 35%, you know, growth at the course of this year. Now, obviously I'm still in profit. So, you know, did part of me did think, is it is it time to sell sentiment, just take your profit and just get back in it at some stage in the future? Actually, you know, the, the other half of me felt that, you know, I'm probably, it's probably worth investing more. Now, I can't actually invest more due to my whole ISO allowance situation. So I'm just going to sit and hold and see what happens um, with sentiment. But ultimately, it's my only hedge play. Now, knowing that its production guidance has been reduced and seeing this trend happen with other previous stocks, basically, I think you can kind of expect sentiment to continue falling for the rest of the year, which is obviously um, quite a disheartening thing to, to know and to potentially see. And that is primarily the only reason why I might consider selling it not because there's anything wrong with sentiment at all but because there's no point just watching your money just disappear and because I can't invest any more money until April 2020 then maybe I can actually make this money work harder until April 2020 and then you know get a new position in sentiment at that stage in the future because I definitely want to keep holding this stock there's nothing wrong with the stock at all um, but obviously this situation has occurred so it's just basically caused me to have to do some more analysis on the business and actually consider what I'm going to do going forward I don't have answers for you if anyone is saying are you going to sell are you going to hold at the moment I'm going to hold but we'll see what happens going forward into the future now I have bought another stock and that stock is basically what I'm calling the final frontier because that's obviously Virgin Galactic. And I bought this stock. I didn't include the stock in the top movers and fallers as that would have been a little bit disingenuous, primarily because I bought the stock after its meteoric rise um, this week. Now, for those of you that follow my 212 updates, you would already know that I actually do have a position in Virgin Galactic already. So this is not new, new in the sense that I've already got a position in one of my pies, a DPMO pie within my 212, but now I've actually made a bit more of a significant position in terms of my free trade ISA and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why I decided to do that. I talked a bit about it last week when I bought Amazon and I actually said that I was actually considering buying Virgin Galactic but because it was my ISA I wanted to actually buy safer growth stocks and there's a lot of risks associated with the likes of Virgin Galactic. Obviously do I wish that I bought it last week when I did consider it? Yes, because obviously it's gone up 25% this week, but in hindsight, it doesn't really matter, to be fair. Um, I'm thinking about this from a 10-year horizon period, and um, I will be adding a lot more money to the position. The position I've opened, for me, relatively speaking, is a small position, um, just to try and de-risk it for the time being, and I will be adding some more money into it as well um, during the course of this tax year, because that money's already sitting within my ISA account. Anyway, let me get into why I decided to buy Virgin Galactic and open another position in Virgin Galactic. So. For those of you that don't know, obviously their whole goal is to basically introduce space tourism um, and effectively the cost per flight is $250,000. Now they've basically received um, 600 customers paying deposits and that total revenue is around the 80 million mark. Once those um, customers 
customers actually paid the full price and they've paid significant deposits obviously once they're actually ready to start those commercial flights then obviously that's going to rise to about 150 million in revenue once the full price is basically paid not only that they've had as the last time that i reported about a 3,000 waiting list of people that have expressed genuine interest uh, in, in actually obviously paying 250,000 for this um some of these analysts are actually saying that's risen to about 6,000 but i'm going to go on the basis of 3,000 just to try and make sure the numbers I quote to you are a little bit modest. So 3,000 people that have expressed an interest. If those 3,000 people also pay 250K per flight, then you're talking another 750 million in revenue. So between 3,600 customers using Virgin Galactic, you're talking 900 million in revenue. So we can basically round it up to roughly around a billion in revenue per 4,000 customers that actually go on the Virgin Galactic. So how big is the market? Well, Virgin Galactic estimate that there's about 2 million individuals worldwide that have the ability to pay $250,000 per flight. So the total adjustable market is about 2 million individuals. And if they get 10% of that total addressable market, so 200,000 people, you're talking 50 billion in revenue. If they get 20%, you're talking 100 billion in revenue. If they get 50% because they have basically limited competition, you're talking 250 billion in revenue. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen overnight, but if you actually then said, you know, based off whatever their growth rate would be, which it's completely speculative, so we wouldn't know what their compounded annual growth rate, but if you just assumed a, a basically an even growth rate over a 10 year period, then actually it's basically talking about 25 billion in revenue um, over a 10 each year for 10 years. Um, and that's obviously just completely average. Chamath Palipatia, the guy you can basically see in your thumbnail, who's effectively the chairman of Virgin Galactic, actually says, you know what, even if we get that, that's not the main use case for this business. The actual main use case for this business is using spaceflight technology to revolutionize air travel and basically allow the likes of me and you to basically go from for example, New York to Japan within four hours because of the level and the atmosphere that they're going to basically be flying. That would obviously significantly reduce the price for mass market consumption. And for me personally, that's the really the biggest play. That's what I'm kind of betting more on. I think the space flight and the space exploration is going to be a significant part of their business. You know, I think there's no reference point whatsoever to really determine how much people are actually going to do it and what's going to effectively happen there. So it's not like a new car business is launched and you can kind of look retrospectively at previous car businesses that have launched and say, you know, based off these car businesses, we expect this car business to do this you can't say that with virgin galactic there's complete there's no data at all to basically make any real form of educated guess they're all going to be some level of speculative forecast but i think when you start saying that actually it's no longer just a space tourism business but actually it's going to be a commercial airline of some kind that's going to revolutionize the air travel business and if you look at all of the issues that happened with boeing this year and and so forth actually you can see there's a lot of potential upside with this business um, and a flight from new york to japan currently is 14 hours so if they can get it down to four hours you're talking what like a 300 percent reduction when you look at the course of this year um, you know, Virgin, you can see on free trade, it says 88%. So effectively this year it's gained about 88%. Uh, you know, versus against the S&P 500 index, which has gained 4% for the year. Um, and then obviously the reason why it went up so heavily this week is that you, you had two more analysts basically cover the stock and both initiate buy ratings. So you had Ronald Epstein from Bank of America basically talk about the fact that he feels that Virgin Galactic has a very unique business with a leading market position, no operating competition and an experienced management team. When you think about the guy who's the CEO is ex-NASA, you've got Chamath Pali Patia, obviously you've got Richard Branson and you've got you know other people from NASA and so forth that's you know part of the business as well um, and he gives a price target of $35. Now originally it was expected that the first commercial flights and the first flight will actually have Richard Branson on it uh, was meant to be at the end of this year I think the expectation due to the whole Divock 91 situation is going to be Q1 Q2 next year but one of the real important notes about Virgin Galactic is the fact that they're vertically integrated so what that basically means is that they own all elements of the supply chain which is basically de-risking their whole business they don't rely on third-party um, batteries from Panasonic as an 
example or they don't write the rely on certain other companies to perform certain other checks and balances for the business so effectively by owning their whole stack end to end then their business is totally de-risked or actually much more de-risked than say other businesses potentially are um, and so you know the likeness of them actually being able to launch their flights um, is a lot more higher than if they were to you know be I guess more of a horizontally integrated business now there was another analyst from Susquehanna Financial a name bro sounds like some ghetto chick from you know Georgia or something Susquehanna Financial which basically talked about a buy rate of 20 dollars obviously at this time when they said it the, the share price was around yeah the 16 dollar mark anyway so um, it's obviously gone past that and they're probably going to have to issue a new price target now um, this business is extremely high risk I am not going to tell you that this is not a high risk business I think this is an exceptionally high risk business I think a number of things can go a hundred and one things can go wrong and I think if one of the hundred and one things that go wrong that could go wrong does go wrong then actually this business can basically tank and potentially fail I don't even want to call out some of those things but I guess you can probably imagine you know space flight being an extremely risky um, venture and if just one of those flights potentially go wrong god forbid then you know I think that could have catastrophic ramifications for the business as a whole so there is a lot of risk into the business and that's the reason why I only put a thousand into the stock for the time being I didn't want to put um, much more into it however I definitely will be increasing my position I do have some money left over within my ISA account and that money for me personally is pretty much earmarked for Virgin Galactic so you know if the Virgin Galactic share price does drop fall down to maybe $17 $16 perhaps um, then obviously I'll I'll top up this business with the rest of that money and then just leave it and see what basically happens but yeah I'm basically buying the future prospect of you know this basically being commercially viable and within the next five to ten years being one of the most significant businesses you know of our generation and you know we shall see whether or not that happens obviously even once I add this money I definitely will be adding more money to it at some point either through the ISO after next tax year or within my pie within 212 as well so you know this isn't going to be the only investment I'm making to the business I think there's going to be continuous rounds of investment that goes into this um, but yeah we shall see what happens with Virgin galactic anyway that's the reason why i've added virgin galactic also to my isa as well as i've got it within my 212 now i've received one dividend payment as you can see and that is from imperial brand so you can see that imperial brands paid me a 27 pound dividend obviously i don't hold imperial brands anymore so i sold it well after the ex dividend day i wasn't even trying to time it to be honest it just organically happened so yeah i don't hold imperial brands no more so that's obviously the last dividend payment that i will receive from imperial brands as a kind of you know farewell gift or whatnot so yeah happy to um happy to not hold that business anymore um, but yeah it's nice to see a little 20 pound dividend coming to the account now I as I've alluded to at the beginning have basically completed my ice for allowance last year I finished it about six weeks early which cost me significantly because I wasn't able to invest during the whole pandemic period so when everything basically went down significantly this whole period here where I lost about 10k worth of value from its peak to its to its bottom um I wasn't able to invest because I'd already maximized my ISO allowance. So I just basically lost the opportunity to get into the market at this significant time. Now I've obviously completed my ISO six months early. So you can, you can almost say that I've basically maximized the risk of this happening again. Um, however, if it does happen again, I'm going to invest, but I will invest outside of my ISA and probably within 212. So my whole focus at the moment now is just to save the money in cash. I'm obviously not going to be investing on a monthly basis. I'm not going to use the general account. I'm just going to leave that as it is um, and I'll just save the money in cash. I'm quite happy with the way my portfolio is and I'm quite happy to ride this out. Obviously, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So let's say as an example, Tesla falls like, you know, 30 percent then obviously I want to um, try and take advantage of that and I won't be able to do so within my ISA so I might initiate a position in Tesla a separate position in Tesla within 212 and then when it comes to my ISA year you know April 2021 um, April the 6th 2021 then obviously the
there'll have to be some form of consolidation between you know the money that I've got within free trade and the money in other places and we'll basically you know we'll deal with that we'll cross that bridge as it comes to it. I'm trying to not think too far in the future but essentially I'm just going to be saving the money in cash and if there are some opportunities that do present themselves then most likely I'll be investing into those opportunities via trading 212 listen hopefully you found this video useful if you did like comment subscribe and I will catch you next time with another investment video. Take care, guys. Peace.